But actually I was not quite prepared for the talk today. Um, but in some senses it's there in my head. So what I'll do is simply formulate some thoughts uh, on two people I'm currently reading. One is Baba Sahib Ambedkar and the other is Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, I won't be able to do any justice to what they have written over their entire lives. Um, because both were actually very unsystematic, inconsistent, many times incoherent, uh, contradictory. So it's very difficult even to call them theorists. And I doubt if one could call them intellectuals. Or whether should one call them political activists or as philosophers, I don't know. So let me begin with a question, which in a way is not so easy to answer. Let's suppose we all are against injustices in society. All kinds. Uh, economic injustice, social injustice, political injustice, cultural injustice, and so on and so forth. The question now is this, why would we want to build a just society? I mean to say, is being against injustice sufficient grounds to build a just society? Think about the question. Because what we find in most radical rhetoric, or even in the rhetoric of Gandhi and Ambedkar, they argue as though pointing out injustices in society is sufficient to argue for the coming into being of what each considers to be a just society. But actually it's not at all an argument. There are two reasons. One is a logical reason, the other is an empirical reason. The logical reason I can give in the form of an analogy. Suppose someone comes and asks you, tells you, I have no reason to live. Would you tell him to go and commit suicide? Apart from not being humane, there is a logical fallacy if you give the answer because you might have no reason to live, but you need an independent reason to commit suicide. So not having reasons to live is not a reason to commit suicide. In exactly the same way, being against injustice is not a reason to be committed to any form of just society. So, for example, I could be consistently be against injustice in society and yet refuse to work towards building a just society. There's nothing inconsistent about it. There's an empirical reason which has hardly been thought of either in Western political philosophy, though in multiple ways Indian traditions have thought about it. How do you know, why do you, apart from everything else, want a just society actually? Why do you want it? Assuming you are for justice, you have only one possible argument, only one. A just society, when it functions, if there are no external disturbances to that system, to a just system, it will always produce just consequences. Really, how do you know that? What mathematical, political, philosophical, ethical theorem exists in the world that shows that a just society left to itself will always produce just consequences. We don't. It is a matter of empirical research. It could very well be the case that some just societies, some just structures, produce unjust consequences left to itself. So in other words, even though we all rhetorically continue to speak about just societies and building on and so on, one of the striking things is about the poverty of this rhetoric, which is why it is rhetoric, is as though deep reflection taken place. And in some senses, both my figures today are in different ways illustrative of this failure, actually, to think some of these issues through. Consider, for example, Ambedkar. I would like to read you a very small citation, and he's, you know that he hated Gandhi as, a, as much as he hated the Brahmins and the Banias. Uh, talking about Gandhism in one of his criticisms, he asked some rhetorical questions. I would like to read them out to you. Under Gandhism, the untouchables may study law, they may study medicine, 
they may study engineering or anything else they may fancy. So far, so good. That means you find it's a good thing. But will the untouchables be free to make use of their knowledge and learning? Will they have the right to choose their profession? Can they adopt the career of lawyer, doctor, or engineer? To these questions, the answer which Gandhism gives is an emphatic no. Now from this we can derive something of Ambedkar's preferences. So he would like, then, what exactly is the kind of society he was fighting for? A society where an untouchable would be able to study engineering, law, medicine, practice it, practice any profession, go to any part of this country and do and perform these professions. But that has already happened, hasn't it, in India? For most of the people. I mean, you can study what you want, provided you have the money to pay for the interest, of course. You can practice wherever you want to. You can study engineering, you can study medicine, you can study law, you can study astronomy, you can study astrology. And in fact, untouchables are encouraged to do so, given scholarships and reservations. So, I submit to you that what Ambedkar dreamt of has already happened in India. But most of you, I'm sure, would not be willing to accept that. But why not? Because if you read his articles, if you read his criticism of Brahminism or Hinduism, you find that all he says is that a man should not be condemned by birth to a particular kind of profession and he must be allowed to perform any profession he feels like. But that is the case in India today. So what exactly then are we fighting for? What exactly is it that we want to achieve? Not such, for example, same thing with uh, Ambedkar. He was very much against parliamentary democracy. He wanted what he called economic democracy, political democracy, where vaguely it means something like equal respect for all. But that's all. But that doesn't tell you anything. But he was very critical of the kind of injustices he saw. Let's assume to both Gandhi and Ambedkar that they were people with great integrity and they believed in whatever they professed and they did their best to bring about some change in society. Let's assume that. Let's grant them that. But even if we grant them that, both are very clear, except Gandhi, perhaps I'll come to that very soon, they were very clear what they were against, but none of us told us what they were for, and whatever they were vaguely for has already come into existence. But nevertheless, if you, look, if you listen to the Dalit activists, if you listen to the uh, untouchables, so-called untouchables, to use Ambedkar's phrase, they feel, they feel that still there is a great deal of injustice in India. There is still uh, the rule of the exploited, the ex oppressive classes today still rule India, and the oppressed still are in the majority, and so on and so forth. But if they are consistent, if they really believe in their, what Ambedkar says, I think they should all give up arms and simply continue in India, because today India has reached a stage which Ambedkar could not even dream of 100 years ago. Now between Ambedkar and Gandhi, as you know, a controversy erupted about caste system. Now it's very difficult to find out what exactly Ambedkar is against, because sometimes he seems to be against religion, sometimes he seems to be against untouchability, sometimes he seems to be against caste system, sometimes he seems to be against Hinduism, sometimes he's against all of them, sometimes he is for everything except untouchability. So it's very difficult to find out where he stands. But let's assume to begin with that one thing is very clear, he was against the practice of untouchability because he felt that the fundamental dignity of human being is taken away when you treat a human being, a fellow human being, as an untouchable which is something which, which accrues by birth, which is what he found especially painful and not a result of merit, because he believed very much in merit. So in principle, Ambedkar should be against reservation policy. Very much so. But anyway, so to come back. Yeah, well, you see, so the, our, our Dalit friends should, should read Ambedkar properly, I think.